advice to tenant organizers, tenant rights organizers, about uh, good and less good strategies that they might employ in the process? If your rent has doubled, there are different ways to cope with the situation and make it through your days. There are therapeutic methods, such as playing darts with a picture of your landlord's private body parts. You can get a roommate, or two or three or four. Build a loft and squeeze more beds onto every floor. You can scratch up each Mercedes that you find on your street. Say, fuck off, yuppie scum, to each yuppie scum you meet. But do not kill your landlord. It will not end well. You'll be living rent-free inside a prison cell. visit very early in the morn to where your landlord lives but don't forget the bullhorn you can form a samba band march up and down his road you can play with firecrackers as you watch them explode you can sing a song about 1848 when renters burned the mansions down and overthrew the state you can talk about your landlord how much you'd like to see him dead just make sure it remains only something that you said yes do not kill your landlord it will not end well you'll be living rent free inside a prison cell Organize a meeting, form a tenants union so it won't be something fleeting. Have some demonstrations, make plans for rent strike, create a list of demands. Perhaps something like no more rent increases, fix things that break, get rid of all that mold in the walls. For goodness sake, no more no cause evictions, no more acting like an ass, no more acting like a member of a feudal ruling class. But do not kill your landlord, it will not end well, you'll be living rent free inside a prison cell. But since I've been having issues with my landlord, um, I've been finding that there's so many other landlords to have issues with. <laughs> Out there. It's 1 a.m. on a Wednesday morning. No one knew what was in store. A fire started and quickly spread till it covered every floor. Stairwell blocked, no way out, smoke and fire all around. Parents grabbed their little babies, dropped them ten floors to the ground. People cry to no avail, twenty-four stories tall, engulfed in flames. The fire ladders were just like toys at all. There were no sprinklers, few smoke alarms, fire extinguisher out of date, all repairs if ever done, always too little, too late. When they built Grenfell, they believed housing was a human right, but all that changed. Now if you're not rich, you should be kept out of sight, out of sight, out of town, or wrapped up neatly, plastic clad. The flats may all be falling apart, but at least they don't look too bad. The residents had tried to warn the authorities for years and years, but all their letters all their blog posts, all their calls fell on deaf ears. Council housing taking space left to rot for by and by. It would someday 
be turned to dust in the forward march to gentrify. And in the meantime, if people perish with their children on their laps, it's the price the market has to pay to house the poor in fire traps. If this was murder, if this was murder, if this was murder, if this was murder. London last month in the richest uh, neighborhood in London where the billionaires have, have their absentee uh, real estate investments. Kensington. So I, I write a lot of songs about uh, the hundredth anniversary of something, <laughs> because, which is especially it's especially a good time for hundredth anniversaries because a lot was happening hundred years ago, which is probably usually the case actually. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this is a song about events that transpired in 1919. I thought I'd get a little jump on things, you know. Scotland far behind, evicted from the highlands, told to go and find a new life in America across the Atlantic Sea, where I joined the millions of other refugees who ended up on Ellis Island as the century began. The wretched of the earth from every foreign land. When I came to this country, broken and bereft, I quickly saw I'd have been no worse off if I'd never left Such awful deprivations as I'd never had to face Born by Swedes and Russians, Africans and every other race Millions of people trying not to end up dead From cholera or black lung or getting clubbed in the head When I came to this country have something on my fork. It was obvious the first thing was to get out of New York. I learned to hop the freight trains, some other stiffs and I. Caught a westbound rattler to give Oregon a try. Signed up for the logging camps, became a timber beast. If I'd stayed there any longer, I'd have surely been deceased. When I came to this country, I worked the copper mines in Butte. I was a candy dancer in Spokane in a candy dancer suit. I heard the rebel girl speak one night in a railway yard. Joined the union right away and got my first red card. I became a hobo organizer for the one big union grand. Preaching the wobbly gospel across this starving land. I soon enough lost track of the number of times I felt a billy club upon my back. Or how many times I saw the tents with freezing kids working in the mines instead of living in the skids. How many times I heard the harring crying from below all across the dungeons with nowhere left to go. When I came to this country, it was a hopeful time of desperation. The red flags flew all across the nation. But when the war began in Europe, we refused to die and kill. We refused to fight a boss's war and serve the boss's will. That's when they got the Legion to burn down our Union halls. All across the land where there used to be four walls. came 
to this country. I had no great expectations, but I didn't think I'd end up back here awaiting deportation. On a steamship on the Hudson, I watched the sunset fade with 20,000 others swept up in the Palmer rays. Counting myself lucky that I'm still alive, remembering the moment that I first arrived when I came to this country. When I came to this country, when I came to this country, I'm going to do something that I didn't just write so I can stop looking at this thing. <laughs> so I used to uh, advise people never to use devices or to have lyrics on stage because it's just completely unprofessional. <laughs> well, <laughs> but then not only is it unprofessional, but it's totally not punk rock. And like, you know, I've been informed by real punk rockers that I'm no longer qualified to be. Because they, they all can tell I'm actually a hippie, you know. <laughs> like, like, as long as I'm faking it pretty well, there, you know, but then... <laughs> So I live in, um, I, you know, not to, not to have any kind of competitive thing going on between Portland and Seattle, but I live in the town that is actually, when you adjust for actual wages of the average Portlander, is the most expensive city in the United States. I think the actual most expensive city in the United States might be this one, but I don't know, it's maybe it's number three, I don't know, it's, uh, but it's, um, so there's a lot of us in Seattle, a lot of us in Portland who want to strangle our landlords. And, you know, those of us in cities like Se Seattle and Portland used to feel kind of isolated if you happen to go to Europe. And, you know, because you go to Europe and you're like, well, people are living well and not wanting to strangle their landlords. This is strange. And <laughs> what am I going to sing about, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I had this quandary for a few years. And then now, unfortunately, the rents are going up in Berlin and Copenhagen and elsewhere, and they want to strangle their landlords too. So, we have more in common than ever. This is, I think, the 21st song I wrote about strangling my landlord, but it, it was a gem, I think. I'm writing you this letter because among the choices, it's probably better than listening to voices raging in my head saying point and shoot. Then after you're dead, your face meets my boot. I don't know your name. It's better that way because I can't play this game. Who knows what I'll say? I feel like I'm burning. I've had it up to here. It's time that you were learning the meaning of fear. I live in these apartments of your private property among your residents. Most of us agree that you're a piece of shit. How does that make you feel? We don't like you one bit and that's for real. We think you're a thief, that you don't care. Seems you're one believers, whatever the market will bear. Whatever you can get away with, what you can make us pay. If we ever get justice, you should fear that day. Landlord. the state we're in. You bribe the politicians so they let you off me. Now the legal situation's just the one you need. For you to make millions, for profits to be high, but even billions won't be with you when you die. I hope you find a death you seek. Meet the devil that you serve. If you live another week, that's more life than you deserve. Landlord. This is more punk rock. <laughs> In the class war you're waiting, there's no question who is winning. But if there's any justice, this is only the beginning. The next act in the play will be written by the tenants. And until your dying day, you'll be paying penance. Your assets will be seized, that's a given. You profiteers of misery start spending time in prison. Then you can get a job, figure out what you do best. You can keep the house you live in, but we're taking all the rest. Landlord.
I'm now going to do a performance string change. I mean, you, we could call it a break, but I'm very quick about these things, usually. But I didn't actually prepare, like if I, you know, have, have the strings out, a string changing device nearby. That's what roadies are for. Roadies. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the gigs I've done that involve roadies are like so memorable that you know because there's only like five of them so these are the gigs where you you know if you really remember like they, with uh, this Italian band where they had a cook who cooked us a dinner before the show and after the show which is how you like I mean it's just not tenable really <laughs> it wouldn't work out wouldn't work out well, and you could tell it wasn't working out so well for at least one of the band members. But it was really tasty, though. So, but what else? That's that was not a very inviting story to change a string to. <laughs> that was also the gig that I realized that I have no potential for a fan base in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Because even though there's millions of left wingers, um, they don't speak English, by and large. So, so either I have to start singing in a Latin language, or they have to speak English. I played for. There were six thousand people in the tennis stadium in Rome. Perfect sound and lights. Everything was perfect, except for my lack of Italian uh -huh. and their lack of English. They were very polite. The last acoustic performer, they booed off stage. <laughs> but uh, I was told that later. He was Italian, so maybe they felt less inclined to boo off to stage a foreign acoustic performer. I don't know. <laughs> they would look like not very left wing for doing that, perhaps. I don't know. But I'm an American, so then maybe it's okay. Because, <laughs> like, there, were riot there was one riot in Germany where I swear. They were only burning German cars because, <laughs> you know, because the German left, I mean, if you've been, if you know anything about the German left and you already understand, but you know, they're, they're very uh, anti-nationalistic to the point where they really would actually just burn German cars in a riot, unless anybody be accused of not liking foreigners. You know? <laughs> so I was there with a car with Danish plates and all the other cars on the block had been destroyed, but... I'll tell you my most random, while well, I'm telling stories for the changing of the string, I'll just tell another one. Because it's just, uh, it doesn't have any point to it. it there's no, uh, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but it was, it was novel enough. It all really happened and it was strange and you don't, these things don't happen that often in anybody's life that, or most people's, not mine. You know, so it was all, I, so I'm hanging out with Cindy Sheehan and two other people on the University of Pittsburgh during a point where the police have told everybody they have to leave. It's during the G20 in 2009, Pittsburgh. So the police had already made an announcement, a dispersal order, but we didn't know about that. So we went onto the campus and then quickly realized the police were attacking everybody on the campus, including sorority girls. And the, you know, because if they weren't inside the buildings, then they were fair game because they weren't not, not pit students according, you know. They had locked all the buildings and, and anybody who wasn't inside was being attacked by the police really violently. And uh, so, so then we, let, we ran, and, um, as everybody else was trying to do. So then we got separated, and, and Cindy and another guy were somewhere else, and me and a woman named Sarah got across the street, and then we realized we're being pursued by a group of riot cops, one of whom had just clubbed me on the back as we were running. And, 
and it was, it was, then we, we were running down another street and realized there's another group of riot cops coming the other direction. There's just two of us, two groups of riot cops, and we're thinking, I don't know what Sarah's thinking, but probably the same thing I'm thinking, we are fucked, you know? And, and then we realized there's this alleyway, and we run down the alleyway thinking this will maybe, you know, increase our lifespans by 20 seconds or so. And then there's a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> so, so we go into the Holiday Inn Express, sit down at the bar and order beers very quickly. And, uh, and suddenly we've been transformed into Holiday Inn Express guests and the cops are no longer chasing us and they're not going in there. And then I'm looking around and we, you can hear the melee going on outside. You can hear outside of the grounds of the Holiday Inn and the police are attacking people and people are screaming. And, and then and then I'm looking around me and realizing this is an awful lot of very young Holiday Inn guests, you know. <laughs> They're all very quiet and being very respectable and respectful and, you know, quiet and drinking beers. And, and, but you're thinking, what are they doing in here in the afternoon drinking beers anyway? I mean, this is just weird. Like, the whole thing was just... And then we realized, of course, they're all protesters who are <laughs> hiding from the cops as well. And, and I had originally planned on coming to Pittsburgh partly because I thought maybe I could get to meet one of my favorite authors who teaches there, uh, Marcus Redeker, who's written all these books about pirates and seafaring workers of the North Atlantic. And so I'm talking to this guy next to me, and it, he turns out to be Marcus Redeker's son, who's a graduate <laughs> student who, who was also was running away from the cops. And then the, the security came in and said, okay, all you protesters have to leave. <laughs> And we're looking at them and we're thinking, you guys don't have guns and the police are attacking everybody out there. And, we're, and th they quickly realize we're not going, of course, we're not going to leave. And then we find out why they were telling us to leave. Because, I'm not, I'm not kidding you here, about like 10, 12 limousines pulled up, full, stretched limousines full of people in suits. It was the Australian delegation to the G20, including <laughs> Kevin Rudd, the Prime Minister of Australia, who got out of the car. <laughs> of the limousine at one in the morning, sat down in the hotel and started watching Australian rugby matches. <coughs> and then we left. <laughs> Let's see. So I'll do, uh, okay, a communist and an anarchist were in a car together. Who was driving? The police. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't drive a car because they run on gas. And if I did, it is run on biomass. I ride a bike. Or sometimes they skateboard, so fuck off all you drivers and your yuppie hordes. Sitting all day in the traffic queues, I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't eat meat, I just live on moldy chives or the donuts that I found in last week's dumpster dives. Look at you people in that restaurant, I think you are so sad when you could have been eating bagels like the ones that I just had. Things you do, I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't wear leather, and I like my clothes in black. And I made a really cool hammock from a moldy coffee sack. I like to hop on freight trains. I think that is so cool. It's so much funner doing this than being stuck in school. I can't believe you're wearing those brand new shiny shoes. I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't have sex. Sexual relationships are inherently unequal. I'll just keep on moshing to anti flag and crass until there are no differences in gender, race, or class. All you brainwashed breeders, you just haven't got a clue. I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't believe in leaders, I think consensus is the key. I don't believe in stupid notions like representative democracy. Whether or not it works, I know it is the case. That only direct action can save the human race. So when I see you in your voting booth, then I know it's true. I'm a better anarchist than you. I am not a pacifist. I like throwing bricks. And when the cops have caught me and I've taken a few licks, I always feel lucky if I get a bloody nose because I feel so militant and everybody knows. 
riot is all through. I'm a better anarchist than you. I'm a better anarchist than you. So I'll... Yeah. My, my baby is awake, I think. Um, the ultimate anarchist. He sings with me. Yes, he's the best anarchist around. <laughs> but following me on Instagram is a, must be a strange experience if you're not me, because it's a, about half the year it's like pictures of my baby, and the other half the year it's pictures of protests. And <laughs> <laughs> But so I, I, and I don't know how many, there must be like probably five people who are actually interested in both of those things. <laughs> <laughs> They're all related to me. <laughs> the country to an arid northern little border town. If you leave early in the day, you'll still be on your way long after the sun is going down. It began as just a ride to the other side, but then was interrupted by the sound of the shattering of glass as the driver tried to pass the men with guns there on the dusty desert ground. There were two already dead, another shot as she fled. No question here whose lives were now at stake. When all is said and done, it is instances like this one, when every move is one that just might make or break. All passengers get out, men with guns began to shout, you Christians now get up against the wall. And then everyone stayed still, saying now, do as you will, you may leave. Or you may kill us all. It wasn't far away, just over a year ago today, when people were massacred exactly in this manner. The pattern, it was clear, all the Muslims here would be safe if they just stood beside this banner. Headscarves passed from hand to hand, among this human band, live together, or together fall. And then nobody moved, showing each of them approved of saying you may leave, or you may kill us all. It wasn't set in stone, there's no way they could have known that this time, this act of solidarity would see the gunmen leave, goals left unachieved on the border there in Mandera County. But sometimes you take a chance, then at a second glance you find you change the world with the passing of a shawl. There are those who will remember, those who on one day in December said you may leave. I will do one more song and then take a break and then I'll do it all over again with different songs. <laughs> and uh, and let's see. best things about being 
me is when you look at your YouTube channel uh, every other day or so, there's a new comment from somebody in Mexico it, commenting in Spanish saying, long live Mexico and, uh, and the Irish people. Oh. And uh, so, which is directed to my way, uh, although I'm not Irish <laughs> or Mexican. My name is John Riley. I'll have your ear only a while. I left my dear home in Ireland. It was death, starvation, or exile. When I got to America, it was my duty to go. Enter the army and slog across Texas to join in the war against Mexico. And it was there in the pueblos and hillsides that I saw the mistake I had made. Part of a conquering army with the morals of a bayonet blade. And there amidst all these poor dying Catholics, screaming children, the burning stench of it all, myself and 200 Irishmen decided to rise to the call. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We marched neath the green flag of St. Patrick, emblazoned with Erin Gobra. Fight with the harp and the shamrock, and the Veritad Pablo Publica. Just 50 years after Wolf Tone, and miles away, the Yanks called us a legion of strangers, and they can talk as they may. But from Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. battles. was the last. Overwhelmed by the cannons from Boston, we fell after each mortar blast. Most of us died on that hillside in the service of the Mexican state. So far from our occupied homeland, we were heroes and victims of fate. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. such a good time watching David that uh, we forgot to brew the coffee, which we meant to do. So right now we're the brewing coffee, and uh, I uh, asked John to perform one of his originals. That's the reason why I asked him to uh, open up, because I, he performed that song for me a couple of nights ago, and I said, wow, you are just an amazing musician. So he's going to do that while we make the coffee. Want me to play another one? Yes, please. That song. Uh, that song. They're no longer chasing us, and they're not going in there. And then I'm looking around, and you can hear the melee going on outside. You can hear outside of the grounds of the Holiday Inn, and the police are attacking people, and people are screaming. And, and, then, and then I'm looking around me and realizing this is an awful lot of very young Holiday Inn guests, you know. 
They're all very quiet and being very respectable and respectful and you know quiet and drinking beers and and but you're thinking, what are they doing in here in the afternoon drinking beers anyway? I mean this is just weird. Like the whole thing was, just, and then we realized, of course, they're all protesters who are <laughs> hiding from the cops as well. And, and I had originally planned on coming to Pittsburgh partly because I thought maybe I could get to meet one of my favorite authors who teaches there, uh, Marcus Redeker, who's written all these books about pirates and seafaring workers of the North Atlantic. And so I'm talking to this guy next to me, and it, he turns out to be Marcus Redeker's son, who's a graduate <laughs> student who, who was also was running away from the cops. And then the, the security came in and said, okay, all you protesters have to leave. <laughs> And we're looking at them and we're thinking, you guys don't have guns and the police are attacking everybody out there. And, we're, and th they quickly realized we're not going, of course, we're not going to leave. And then we find out why they were telling us to leave because, I'm not, I'm not kidding you here, about like 10, 12 limousines pulled up, full, stretched limousines full of people in suits. It was the Australian delegation to the G20, including <laughs> Kevin Rudd, the Prime Minister of Australia, <laughs> oh, who got out means. of the car. <laughs> of the limousine at one in the morning, sat down in the hotel and started watching Australian rugby matches. <coughs> and then we left. <laughs> Let's see. So I'll do, uh, okay, a communist and an anarchist were in a car together. Who was driving? The police. The police. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't drive a car because they run on gas. But if I did, it is run on biomass. I ride a bike. Or sometimes they skateboard, so fuck off all you drivers and your yuppie whores. Sitting all day in the traffic queues, I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't eat meat, I just live on moldy chives or the donuts that I found in last week's dumpster dives. Look at you people in that restaurant, I think you are so sad when you could have been eating bagels like the ones that I just had. I think it is a shame things you do. I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't wear leather and I like my clothes in black and I made a really cool hammock from a moldy coffee sack. I like to hop on free trains. I think that is so cool. It's so much funner doing this than being stuck in school. I can't believe you're wearing those brand new shiny shoes. I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't have sex and there will be no sequel because heterosexual relationships are inherently unequal. I'll just keep on moshing to anti-flag and crass until there are no differences in gender, race, or class. All you brainwashed breeders, you just haven't got a clue. I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't believe in leaders. I think consensus is the key. I don't believe stupid notions like representative democracy. Whether or not it works, I know it is the case that only direct action can save the human race. So when I see you in your voting booth, then I know it's true. I'm a better anarchist than you. I am not a pacifist. I like throwing bricks. And when the cops have caught me and I've taken a few licks, I always feel lucky if I get a bloody nose. Because I feel so militant and everybody knows By the time the riot is all through I'm a better anarchist than you I'm a better anarchist than you So I'll... Yeah baby is awake, I think. Um, the ultimate anarchist. He sings with me. Yes, he's the best anarchist around. <laughs> but following me on Instagram is a, must be a strange experience if you're not me, because it's a, about half the year it's like pictures of my baby and the other half of the year, it's pictures of protests. And <laughs> <laughs>
<coughs> but so I, I, and I don't know how many, there must be like probably five people who are actually interested in both of those things. <laughs> <laughs> They're all related to me. <laughs> Across the country to an arid northern little border town. If you leave early in the day, you'll still be on your way long after the sun is going down. It began as just a ride to the other side, but then was interrupted by the sound of the shattering of glass as the driver tried to pass the men with guns there on the dusty desert ground. There were two already dead, another shot as she fled. No question here whose lives were now at stake. When all is said and done, it is instances like this one, when every move is one that just might make or break. All passengers get out, men with guns began to shout, you Christians now get up against the wall. And then everyone stayed still, saying now, do as you will, you may leave. Or you may kill us all. It wasn't far away, just over a year ago today, when people were massacred exactly in this manner. The pattern, it was clear, all the Muslims here would be safe if they just stood beside this banner. Headscarves passed from hand to hand, among this human band, live together, or together fall. And then nobody moved, showing each of them approved of saying you may leave, or you may kill us all. It wasn't set in stone, there's no way they could have known that this time, this act, of solidarity would see the gunmen leave goals left unachieved on the border there in Mandera County but sometimes you take a chance that at a second glance you find you've changed the world with the passing of a shawl there are those who will remember those who on one day in December said you may leave We'll do one more song and then take a break and then I'll do it all over again with different songs <laughs> and uh, and let's see best things about being me is when you look at your YouTube channel uh, every other day or so there's a new comment from somebody in Mexico it, commenting in Spanish saying long live Mexico and, uh, and the Irish people uh -huh. and uh, so which is directed to my way uh, although I'm not Irish <laughs> or Mexican My name is John Riley. I'll have your ear only a while. I left my dear home in Ireland. It was death, starvation, or exile. When I got to America, it was my duty to go. Enter the army and slog across Texas to join in the 
war against Mexico. And it was there in the pueblos and hillsides that I saw the mistake I had made. Part of a conquering army with the morals of a bayonet blade. And there amidst all these poor dying Catholics, screaming children, the burning stench of it all, myself and 200 Irishmen decided to rise to the call. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We marched neath the green flag of St. Patrick, emblazoned with Erin Goldra. Fight with the harp and the shamrock, and the Veritad Republica. Just 50 years after Wolf Tone, 5,000 miles away, the Yanks called us a legion of strangers, and they can talk as they may. But from Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We fought them in five major battles. Churubusco was the last. Overwhelmed by the cannons from Boston, we fell after each mortar blast. Most of us died on that hillside in the service of the Mexican state. So far from our occupied homeland, we were heroes and victims of fate. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. I don't know what's happening here, um, but I, I'm trying to find the resistance. And I just, I just don't know where to, where to look. And I guess, I'm, and I feel like kind of lost because I keep on hearing on the media that there's a resistance going on. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, who are these people? Who are they talking about? I don't know. I mean, there's been some protests, but it's just, I'm just not seeing what they're talking about exactly in terms of a resistance. Like, because that's usually the term resistance implies more than just. <clears throat> protests, you know, uh, and then uh, protests that are full of Democratic senators, you know, coming and, and saying, I'm part of the resistance, you know, no, you're fucking not, you're a, <laughs> you're a Democratic senator, you supported all the wars that the Democrats started, you know, what, what makes you part of resistance? So like, uh, There was, um, so there's a bill going through the, the Senate now that would, um, that would give a, that anybody who supports the boycott of Israel would, it would be a felony punishable by up to 20 years in prison and up to a $1 million <laughs> fine. And, you know, there's all kinds of ways that that might get thrown out by the courts and, you know, who knows, but, but that's what they're pr proposing. That's what APAC is proposing. And uh, here in Washington, uh, Maria Cantwell supports that bill. As is Ryan Wa Ron Wyden in Oregon. And some guy I've never heard of who is apparently positioning himself to be a leader of the resistance, the hashtag resistance. But I was, uh, last time I had a baby, 
Well, I didn't have the baby, but you know. My daughter, um, she was 11 now, and when she was two, we were hanging out in a pub together, and, uh, <laughs> and, and then we got the news that Barack Obama had won, and, and, um, and the pub erupted in, in happiness, and people were hugging each other and saying, we won. And I thought, oh shit, man, I've been around too long <laughs> to share this happiness <laughs> with you. I wrote this uh, on before the second uh, election, where where the, the Democratic resistance won the second you know, election back in 2012. I turned on my TV, though it was hard to see these men who would be head of state. What a great country, from sea to shining sea, we watch the Republicans debate. Newt stood with his third wife and said, you bet your life the president is a red. He wants to tax the rich a lot, take your limo and your yacht. He wants to have the bankers' heads. And if he gets in again, he'll paint the White House pink, and then he'll hire Chavez as his VP. Then we'll be right on track to give capitalism the sack, along with the insurance industry. If only it were true, if only it were true, I'd be so happy, wouldn't you? If only it were true, if only it were true, if only it were true. These songs are all sing-alongs, I should have mentioned a while ago. <laughs> a sing-along being a song you've heard before, so that might or might not apply. But He'll give everyone food stamps and wheelchair ramps. He'll subsidize windmills and maple syrup. He'll cripple industries with eco-friendly policies. And pretty soon we will be just like Europe. He'll shut down oil wells, give out solar cells to every home in Delaware and Illinois. He'll ban logging in the parks, he'll send the works of Karl Marx to the homes of every American girl and boy. He'll abolish pesticides, he'll be giving out free rides and free lunches too in his high-speed train. He'll start lots of public works full of union perks, he'll fill all the cities up with bicycle lanes. Yeah. If only it were true, if only it were true, I'd be so happy, wouldn't you? If only it were true, if only it were true, if only it were true. Watch out, his critics tell, this shall be our death knell. He'll pull the troops out and end all of our wars. He'll gut military spending, our empire will be ending, and soon we'll be invaded by the Moors. He'll legalize all drugs, give away beer mugs, and hookahs to every child, and Korans. He'll ban religions from the schools, give 40 acres and a mule to every person who makes less than 50 grand. He'll close Guantanamo to torture, he'll say no, he'll make us all drive electric cars. He'll reinstate the fairness doctrine, take off that damn flag pin, and he'll put Rupert Murdoch behind bars. If only it were true, if only it were true, I'd be so happy, wouldn't you? If only it were true, if only it were true, if only it were true. If only it were true, if only it were true, I'd be so happy, wouldn't you? If only it were true, if only it were true, if only it were true. So um, Margaret Thatcher said <laughs> there was no such thing as society. And, uh, and I thought, you know, it's, it's a sort of a patently ridiculous thing to say on the face of it. But then <coughs> when you think about living in a society ruled by neoliberalism, <laughs> then ultimately there becomes no such thing as society. Because what kind of a thing, how can you call it a society when you live in a city like this one, for example, where like, I think it's similar stats to Portland. I, I should speak of Portland because I know in Portland for sure. It's 50% renters, 50% owners, which of course, what does that mean to bank most of the time? But anyway, <laughs> these, but, but of course the difference, even if the bank technically is the owner of your home, if you actually own a home on a mortgage that's not a subprime mortgage, then at least you have 
the, the, some kind of consistency in terms of knowing that your rent, what your rent is going to be in 10 years, you know? So the, what this, the impact in, in, in terms of the social fabric of a society, just of that alone, r to say nothing of the rising rents, of course my rent is double, the, everybody's rents are doubling, tripling, but uh, to say nothing of the rising rents, just the fact of renters and owners, what this means is that the, base, the basic interests of people who own a house are for the neighborhood to improve in value for things like better schools, nicer parks, better services, fewer potholes. Those are good things. And of course those are good for society generally, you, you could say, so it's easy to make that argument. So, so it's, it's not hard to, you know, want these things, you know, but, and not to feel bad about it, right? But the thing is that for, for the rest of us, uh, you know, actually all those things just raise the rent, you know, and so actually what we want is like fewer, fewer nice supermarkets, fewer Starbucks, you know, fewer, more potholes. We need arson, basically. We want crime, we want people getting mugged at night. You know, that is good, you know, because then uh, hopefully the neighborhood gets a good dangerous reputation and, and then, you know, the, the rents don't increase as fast. So that's a weird makeup for a society. And um, so I wrote this song this is not about my landlord so much as about my friend Margot's landlord because Margot was told one day uh, w with her three small children in tow that she had to move and, um, and, that, uh, and that basically she'd be okay because she was a renter. She was just a renter. Her landlord said, you're just a renter. And um, this landlord is still alive today, amazingly enough, which is a real testament to the sort of patience and love and of humanity, I think, or fear of prison sentences. Ten thousand yuppies just moved here. Ten thousand others came last year. The rent has doubled since I moved in. Each month I take it on the chin. Each month I wonder how many more can I stay in? Portland before, before I move into my car or end up somewhere behind bars. 10,000 yuppies say don't complain now that the city is in the fast lane. It's just the market and it knows best. That's how the bankers built the West. So just get rich and you can stay. Otherwise, just go away. There's no room here for us holding on. Just a renter, this ain't my town. Might as well just burn it down for all I care. Ten thousand yuppies think it's great to invest in Portland real estate. Keep Portland weird, they like to say, but that was over yesterday. Of their achievements, they're so proud. Living lives in some cloud, but unlimited data will get you nowhere if you can't afford to care. I'm just a renter, this ain't my town. Might as well just burn it down for all I care. Ten thousand yuppies, and on each block, they're flipping houses and taking stock. Where's the next place? They can transform tents and mansions, the new norm. They like TED Talks, they like greed, they like wine bars, they like weed, they like bike lanes, they want more. They're the face of the new class war. I'm just a renter, this ain't my town. Might as well just burn it down for all I care. For all I care. One of my daughter's first phrases, possibly her first phrase, actually, uh, well, her first three-word three, three word phrase, um, anyway, at the age of two, was burn it down. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but after, <clears throat> after a couple months after I wrote that last song, when she had heard me rehearsing it in the house many, many times, finally one day she said to me, um, if, 
Uh, if we have to move, if, if you have to move into your car, I can live with mommy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh shit. She's thinking, like, she's thinking, like, you know, I didn't really want her to be worried about that, you know, because she doesn't actually have to worry about that at the moment, you know, so. Um, I'd rather she weren't actually thinking about that for months, because that's what kids do, you know. They think about things for a long time, oftentimes, before they actually say something, so that, um, that's what people do, I guess, generally, but oftentimes. There was a Syrian refugee talking to a Hungarian border guard. a song that you've done several hundred times and then you completely forget the chords. <laughs> that, uh, especially in the summer. Because <laughs> I'm usually not playing many gigs in the summer. So um, living in Seattle, there were many rumors that, uh, and, and this was before the internet when I lived here, so there were a lot of rumors that you just, like at least back then, I just wouldn't try to substantiate these rumors because it's too hard. You have to go to a library and then what? You know, I mean, I don't even know what, how you would, but uh, you know, where to find this information. So there was a lot of rumors that went around. I don't think it's changed. It's just now we can attempt to verify whether the rumors are true, except that there's like 5,000 times as many of them, you know, so, so it takes longer. But, I heard a rumor that the sheriff of, uh, our, you know, uh, Sheriff Arpaio of uh, Maricopa County in Arizona, that his middle name was Mussolini. And, uh, and I looked on Wikipedia, and in fact, the rumor had started because it said so on Wikipedia, and I started to write a whole song about him having the middle name of Mussolini, which was just perfect, you know. I mean, it was too good to be true, and then it turned out not to be true. So the next day, I looked on Wikipedia, it changed to Michael. So what do you do with that? But, um, but I did hear a rumor, which I believe is true, that the reason why they, uh, Red Square, well, of course it's called Red Square, but who knows what it's, I don't know what it's really officially called, but the, the square there in 
UW. Um, Red do they still call it Red Square? Yes, it is. So the, the reason why it's all paved and like flat is because it's to make it easier to spray the water cannon uh, so that the protesters would go, you know, sliding away because it used to be they could grab onto trees. You know, and then and now they just slide. I, that maybe not. That is that completely. Do you have to know that that's total bullshit? You you look like you you know that that's not true. Is that not true? It's not true. Okay, that was a rumor. It's a good rumor though. Because then sometimes you do a show and like somebody is around who actually like worked at the university at the time they decided to pave it and like maybe knows why they paved it. it was probably erosion, right? <laughs> But there were a lot of good protests anywhere there, anyway, <laughs> at the time, back then. And later, uh, there were campuses that were designed, some of the campuses when, when buildings were later designed in the, in the 70s, um, now this is, I believe, actually true, where they, they would design the campuses in some cases so that there would be multiple entrances, which, of course, there's a different reasons why you might do that, of course, and, but one of them is for people to escape when there's protests to get out of the buildings, like uh, administrators, sometimes who have like secret tunnels, they can get uh, down there. I don't. That's probably not true either. Right? I'm just spreading false rumors. Somebody needs to look into this. I think Mike Mike Davis wrote about this actually. <laughs> Everything in this song is true, though. just got a, a message just before this gig was happening I got a, a, a message uh, from my friend Ryan Harvey a wonderful songwriter out in Maryland who, who said do you have signal and I'm so 
with the times I even knew what he was talking about. He's talking about an app, and I don't. But I, but I downloaded it when he said uh, that because I knew that this meant that there was some kind of encrypted communication mm -hmm. that was going to come my way. And he said, somebody has an interesting story that you'll like. And I don't know what it is, so I'll find out. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it just made me wonder, I don't know how secure Signal really is, but... I should be gigging in New Zealand, uh, but I'm not. I'm stuck at Narita instead. I should be singing into the smoking kiwi pot and chilling with the kiwi reds. But when I showed up at the airport to board my flight, I was handed somebody's cell phone. Suddenly the future didn't look so bright and I entered the twilight zone. The woman on the line said, hello, I'm from immigration. You may have a ticket, but you can't go to our great island nation. I felt like I'd been hit in the face with a big old kiwi log. Then I felt the Stasi's cold embrace when she said, I've been reading your blog. Spies are reading my blog, the introduction and the prologue. And if that's so, it just might be true that they're watching this video too. I normally don't get many views A few hundred friends and kooks So it comes as surprising news That some of them are kiwi spooks I try to get my missives out And cause some small commotion Someone's listening now, there's no doubt Across the South Pacific Ocean Spies are reading my blog The introduction and the prologue And if that's so, it just might be true that they're watching this video too. Were you strip searched in Trondheim, she asked. What kinds of things do you smoke? Have you ever been charged with a crime? Are you rich or are you broke? Have you ever been turned away from any borders you tried to cross? What kind of venues did you plan to play? Do you use dental floss? I said, it seems a bit unusual for you to do things quite this way. I asked her, is this normal? But she wouldn't say, she'd just repeat her message. At Narita, you shall remain. I've read your blog, each vile passage, and you may not board that plane. Spies are reading my blog, the introduction and the prologue. And if that's so, it just might be true that they're watching this video, too. They're watching this video. There's, um, there's a lot of, you know, monuments and, you know, ways that people remember the past and, and governments and institutions remember the past. And in, in Denmark and in Sweden, uh, these two countries were at war longer than any two countries in the history of the world. 400 years, Denmark and Sweden were at war. And all over Denmark, you'll see uh, statues of the Swede killers and who are looking towards Sweden, you know, with suspicion. And all over Sweden, you'll see the, the Dane killers looking towards Denmark with terrible suspicion. And of course, the two countries get along swimmingly now, and they're very similar to social democracies with great living standards and all that. But um, and then every once in a while, there will be like a a monument with, that expresses a bit of gr some regret, like the, the, the bloodiest battle between Denmark and Sweden was, I believe, the Battle of Lund, which happened in this beautiful little Swedish college town. 10,000 people hacked each other to death. And, uh, and there's a commemorative uh, plaque uh, in their memory saying maybe Scandinavians could stop killing each other someday. And, uh, in, in Centralia, Washington, I was there on the way up here, and it was really quite something to see that the, the one main, like, city-sponsored uh, commemoration of the Centralia massacre was not of the IWW folks who were massacred, uh, but of the American Legion uh, people who attacked the Union Hall and were killed by the Union members who were defending their hall from being attacked. Those are the ones who are commemorated. And that's pretty much sums up the USA, you know, in terms of who we commemorate. But um, in Germany, which is a far more reflective country, society, than this one generally, 
what, where the left has had a massive impact on the educational system for the about, since about 68. Uh, they, uh, they commemorate the past in a much different way. And all over the German cities, you'll see little stones called stumbling stones, Stolpersteine, which uh, tell you who used to live or work in this building and at w what date they were taken away and what date they died. And these are, there are these everywhere. And I was walking with a couple of friends from Hamburg and we came across the Stolpersteine of her grandparents. And this is a song about her grandmother who survived the war, but they still get stones if they were taken to death camps <coughs> and then survived. Then there's not the second date, there's just the first date. Katarina Jakob, long before she took that name, was organizing workers in Hamburg just the same. Organizing beneath the flag of deepest red, a new dawn of peace and freedom clearly shining in her head. Katarina Jakob first was sent to jail when the trappings of democracy all began to fail. She was frequently arrested in and out of custody while her first husband was in hiding from the Nazis. Katarina Jakob was acquitted of a crime, but the Gestapo had the last word. They weren't finished with her this time. She was sent to Ravensbrück, a killing hunger at her side. She heard of the execution, how her second husband died. For Katarina Jakob, the end was close at hand. She was on a death march with a ragged starving band. Marching through a forest, being led by the SS. What would happen hours later seemed impossible to guess. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Katarina Jakob thought about her children and the friends and comrades taking care of them. Not knowing yet if any of them survived, not knowing that soon she'd see her daughters both alive. Katarina Jakob watched the German soldiers flee, streaming from the east, that's what she was seeing. Allied bombers flew above them. She thought they all might die, and then soon there was the silence of all the SS men. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Katarina Jakob saw red flags flapping in the breeze above the Russian tanks, and she fell upon her knees. And so many different voices in so many different tongues sang the most beautiful song that could ever have been sung. In German, Lithuanian, in Polish, and in Dutch, a myriad of melodies has never had been such in Russian and in Yiddish, Italian and French, emerging from the forest beneath the trench. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Falke hört die Signale auf zum letzten Gefecht. Die Internationale erkämpft das Menschenrecht. Falke hört die Signale 
auf zum letzten Gefecht. Die Internationale erkämpft das Menschenrecht. I was talking with an elderly German man who, who spent his youth uh, running from Allied bombing raids, and, and he said, even if you, um, he said, even at the age of seven, eight, nine, uh, he said, I don't know whether this is true, I just know what he said, but what he said was, even at that age, uh, he didn't feel like a victim because he understood the concept that if you bomb somebody, they might bomb you back. And I thought, that's, that's, you know, that's some sophisticated logic. <laughs> that's, if, if the American politicians could figure that out, that would be good. <laughs> started cleaning up the mess how many souls departed is anybody's guess they're already proposing that they turn it up a notch time they were imposing an even tighter watch terrorists everywhere by which they do not mean no meetings with blonde hit for american marines all the fighter planes all of those who die when the bombs rain down from way up in the sky if you bomb somebody they might just bomb you back on the team we will talk of integration most of them agree there's too much immigration they'll talk of social policies things they should have done before whatever you say don't mention the war if you bomb somebody they might just bomb you back The cry for more cops and laws against encryption Time to pull out all the stops of every description Time to torture suspects, send them back from where they came Life goes as you'd expect in the imperial game They'll say that now we must strengthen our will We mustn't bow down to those we kill To those we maim, to the country's lost Don't mention their names or the cost You bomb somebody They might just bomb you back Just bomb you back. I'll do one more and thank you all so much for coming and thanks so much to Darwin and Rose and John for making this happen. Um, and uh, if you want to learn how musicians survive these days uh, in the post-merch era, because we're mostly selling fewer than 20% as many CDs as we used to, mm -hmm. and most of the musicians I know don't make a living anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way that we're doing it, uh, those of us who are still making a living, is through um, basically CSAs, just the same way that the small farmers are doing it, except exchange agriculture for art. And uh, you basically sign up to receive free music and um, but you give us money, which you would be, but you'd be getting it for free anyway if we weren't, you know, if we were still making it somehow, <laughs> um, theoretically, you know. But so, <clears throat> davidrovix.com slash subscribe, you can learn about that. And I wrote a, I wrote a song um, that's related to that, but it's, I'm not gonna do it, because I wanna do this one instead. And, um, this is, uh, you know, there's uh, really, um, <clears throat> the last administration uh, deported two and a half million people, um, you know, and so, <clears throat> so I really, really want to kill all the Democratic politicians who get on the stage at these rallies and say that they're against the deportations because they're not. They're lying. <clears throat> they're just pretending. And, and it's insulting. It's incredibly insulting that anybody would believe that Ron Wyden and Maria Cantwell are, uh, you know, against uh, deporting people. Why, if they were against it, why didn't they say something four years ago, eight years ago? <laughs> but, um, but it's wrong anyway, and, and, it's, and it's a whole different situation as I'm sure you realize now because, uh, uh, you know, because, well, basically, in a nutshell, my neighbors 
uh, are, are scared now uh, because, <clears throat> because they know that it doesn't matter whether they've committed a crime, uh, you know, the, the crime of being here is enough and, and they never, you know. One of my neighbors never leaves the apartment and, and I think she's afraid of being deported and uh, <clears throat> so I can't imagine how she's feeling now. But um, one of the first times, uh, you know, the whole, the whole in, in Germany, there's like this, the, the whole idea of international solidarity is, is uh, at a whole different level than it is in most countries. Like people would die for it, you know. And, uh, and a lot of people do and have. But uh, in Germany, when I first got to Germany in the 80s, uh, I mean in the 90s, um, there was a, uh, I, I went to a protest and I heard people chanting, uh, Kein Mensch ist illegal, no one is illegal. And I saw these signs all over the country, no one is illegal. And the, the concept that, um, that people have rights, of course all the countries in the world have signed these, you know, these, these UN conventions that say people have rights regardless of who they are, where they are, where they're from, you know, citizenship, just for being human you have rights. You know, that's, that's the idea, you know, of human rights. <laughs> so sometimes I feel like it needs to be, it needs to be said again, you know, yeah. this concept, because we, we say the word human rights and it's like one word and, and you're not really like, yeah, we're talking about humans anywhere in the planet that have rights for being here on the planet. Clouds gather in your forests, drift to my desert town. I think of far off places as the rain is coming down. You're bent down in the fields, picking fruit there from the vine. And it ends up on my table as it moves on down the line. The moon shines brightly in the night sky. The river flows from south to north. With the changing of the seasons, the birds migrate back and forth. But they say that you can't come here, not in the light of day. Somebody has got plans for you. Carve at home or hide away. Will we open up the borders? Tear down the prison walls, declare that no one is illegal. bought and sold. One way goes the gunships, the other goes the coal. Free trade is like a needle, drawing blood straight from your heart. The border's like a prison, keeping friends apart. Will we open up the borders? The prison walls declare that no one is illegal. Watch the giant as it falls. Stand. 
these words Workers of the world Unite will we Open up the borders Tear down the prison walls Declare that no one is illegal No one is illegal No one is illegal to be part of this evening. Yeah. That's, how, that's how I feel. And I'm just so glad that we heard such awesome uh, music tonight, both David and John. Thank, Thank you all you. for coming. Yeah. Maybe you can get some coffee and then uh, maybe David could do another song. Oh, I think David yeah. can can't push it too much, but one more, one more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll have some coffee while we're at it. One more before the coffee, perhaps. <laughs> 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 Be, but um, yeah, we'll do. Uh, I, I I noticed one day that uh, most of the labor songs in English um, uh, were written um, in the 1930s, and so. That's the wrong key. <laughs> Terribly anticlimactic. Gather round, all you workers, whether you have a job or not. You pick the tomatoes, you who grow the pot. You stay home to raise the children, you that record the sound. Flip the burgers, all you workers, gather round, gather round, all you workers, all of you who pull the shots, you who wash the dishes, park the cars in parking lots, you who clean the bathrooms, put the caskets in the ground. Dig the dishes, all you workers, gather round. Gather round, all you workers, all of you who write the code. You who teach the children, you who pave the roads. You on the freight trains wherever they be bound you who drive the buses all you workers gather round gather round all you workers struggling to pay the rent you who work a second job and wonder where All you actors on the screen You who point the cameras and write for the magazines You who launch the missiles You who fire from the ground You who fly the helicopters All you workers gather round, gather round you workers, gather round, and you will know that gathered all together, we can vanquish any foe. As sure as we're made of water, so history has found the workers have the
the power if all we workers 